Book Six, Chapter Nine of the History of Sir Richard Carmody. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anne Fletcher, Richmond, Tasmania, 2020. The History of Sir Richard Carmody by Lucas Mallet. Book Six, Chapter Nine telling how Ludovic Quayle and Honoria St. Quentin watched the trout rise in the long water. Some hour and a half later, Miss St. Quentin passed down the flight of stone steps leading from the southern end of the terrace to the grass slopes of the park. Arrived at the lowest step, she gathered the skirt of her dress up over one arm, thereby securing greater freedom of movement and displaying a straight length of pink and white petticoat. Thus prepared, she fared forth over the still smoking turf. The storm had passed, but the atmosphere remained thick and humid. A certain opulence of colour obtained in the landscape. The herbs in the grass, wild thyme, wild balm and star-flowered chamomile, smelt strongly aromatic as she trod them underfoot, while the beds of bracken, dried and yellowed by the drought, gave off a sharp, woody scent. Usually, when thus alone and in contact with nature, such matters claimed Honoria's whole attention, ministering to her love of earth law and of Mother Earth, producing in her silent worship of those primitive deities who at once preside over and inhabit the wasteland and the tilth, the untamed forest and the pastures where heavy uddered sweet breath cows lie in the deep meadow grass the garden ground, all pleasant orchard places, and the broad promise of the waving crops. But this afternoon, although the colour, odour, warmth, and all the many voices praising the refreshment of the rain were sensibly present to her, Honoria's thought failed to be engrossed by them. For she was in process of worshipping younger and more compassionate deities, sadder, because more human, ones, whose office lies not with nature in her eternal repose and fecundity, but with man in his eternal failure and unrest. Not August Ceres, giver of the golden harvest fields, or fierce Sibela, the goddess of the many paps, but spare, brown-habited St. Francis, serving his brethren with bleeding hands and feet, held empire over her meditations. In imagination, she saw, saw with only too lively realisation of detail, that eighteen-year-old lad in the factory at Westchurch, drawn up, all the unspent hopes and pleasures of his young manhood active in him, by the loose gearing into the merciless vortex of revolving wheels. And there, without preparation, without pause of warning, without any dignity of shouting multitude, of arena or of stake, martyred, converted in a few horrible seconds from health and wholeness into a formless lump of human waste. And up and down the land, as she reflected, wherever the great systems of trade and labour which build up the mechanical and material prosperity of our day go forward, kindred things happen, let alone question of all those persons who are born into the world already injured, or bearing the seeds of foul and disfiguring diseases in their organs and their blood. Verily, Richard Carmody's sad family was a rather terribly large one, well calculated to maintain its numbers, even to increase. For neither the age of human sacrifice nor of cannibalism is really over, nor is the practice of these limited to savage peoples in distant lands or faraway isles of the sea. They form the basis, actually, though in differing of outward aspect, of all existing civilizations, just as they formed the basis of all past civilizations, a basis, moreover, perpetually re-cemented and re-laid. And, as she considered, being courageous and fair-minded, it was inevitable that this should be so, unthinkable that it should be otherwise, since it made, at least indirectly, for the prosperity of the majority and development of the race. Considering which, the apparently cruel paradox and irony of it, Honoria swung down past the scattered hawthorns thick with ruddy fruit, across the fragrant herbs and short sweet turf, through the straggling fern-breaks which impeded her progress, plucking at her skirts, 
careless of the rich colour and ample beauty outspread before her. But soon, as a bird after describing far-ranging circles drops at last upon the from first determined spot, so her thoughts settled down, with relief, yet in a way unwillingly, and that not out of any lingering repulsion, but rather from a certain proud modesty and self-respect, upon Richard Calmady himself. Not only did he apprehend all this far more clearly and more intimately than she could, had he not spoken of the advantages of a certain blackness, Honoria's vision became somewhat indistinct. But he set out to deal with it in a practical manner, and in this connection she began to understand how it had come about that through years of ingratitude and neglect and of loose living on his part, his mother could still remain patient, could endure and supremely love. For behind the obvious, the almost coarse tragedy and consequent appeal of the man's deformity, there was the further appeal of something very admirable in the man himself, for the emergence and due blossoming of which it would be very possible, very worth while, for who so once recognised its existence, to wait. John Knott had been right in his estimate of Richard, Ludovic Quayle had been right, Lady Carmody had been right. Honoria had begun to believe that, even before Richard had come forth from his self-imposed seclusion in the spring. The belief had increased during her subsequent intercourse with him, had been reinforced during her few days' visit at Whitsuntide. Yet, until now, she had never freely and openly admitted it. She wondered why. And then hastily she put such wondering from her, Again, a certain proud modesty held her back. She did not want to think of herself in relation to him, or of him in relation to herself. She wished, for a reason she refused to define, to exclude the personal element. Doing that, she could permit herself larger latitude of admiration. His acknowledgement of fellowship with and obligation of friendship towards all victims of physical disaster kindled her enthusiasm. She perceived that it was contrary to the man's natural arrogance, natural revolt against the humiliation put upon him, a rather superb overcoming, in short, of nature by grace. Nor was it the outgrowth of any morbid or sentimental emotion. It had no tincture of the hysteric element. It took its rise in conviction and in experiment. For Richard, though still young, struck her as remarkably mature. He had lived his life, sinned his sins, she did not doubt that, suffered unusual sorrows, bought his experience in the open market and at a sufficiently high price, and this was the result. It pleased her imagination by its essential unworldliness, its idealism and individuality of outlook. She went back on her earlier judgment of him, first formulated as a complaint, he was strong, whether for good or evil, now unselfishly for good, and Honoria, being herself among the strong, supremely valued and welcomed strength. And so it happened that the tone of her meditations altered, being increasingly attuned to a serious but very real congratulation, for she perceived that the tragedy of human life also constitutes the magnificence of human life, since it affords, and always must afford, supreme opportunity of heroism. She had traversed the open space of turf, and come to the tall iron hurdles enclosing the paddock. She folded her arms on the topmost bar of the iron gate, and stood there. She wanted to rest a little in these thoughts that had come to her. She was not quite sure of them as yet, but if they meant anything, if they were other than mere rhetoric, they must mean a very great deal, into harmony with which it would be necessary to bring her thought upon many other subjects. She was conscious of an excitement, a reaching out towards some but half-disclosed glory, some new and very exquisite fullness of life. But was it new, after all? Was it not, rather, the at last permitted activity of faculties and sensibilities hitherto refused development, voluntarily, perhaps cowardly, held in check and repressed. 
she appeared to be making acquaintance with unexpected depths of apprehension and emotion in herself and this for cause unknown brought her into more lively commerce with her immediate surroundings and the sentiment of them her eyes rested on them questioningly as though they might afford a tally to perhaps an explanation of the strange yet lovely emotion which had invaded her here in the valley notwithstanding the recent drought the grass was lush across the paddock just within the circuit of the far railings a grove of large beech trees broke the expanse of living green beyond seen beneath their down-sweeping branches the surface of the long water repeated the hot purple the dun colour and silver pink of the sky on the opposite slope extending from the elm avenue to the outlying masses of the woods and upward to the line of oaks which run parallel with the park palings were cornlands the wheat a red gold was already for the most part bound in shocks a company of women wearing lilac and pink sunbonnets and all round blue linen aprons faded by frequent washing to a fine clearness of tone came down over the blonde stubble they carried in little baskets and shining tins tea for the white-shirted harvesters who were busy setting up the storm-fallen sheaves they laughed and talked together and their voices came to honoria with a pleasant quality of sound two stumbling baby children hand in hand followed them as did a small white and tan spotted dog one woman was bareheaded and wore a black bodice which gave a singular value to her figure amid the all obtaining yellow of the corn the scene in its simple and homely charm held the poetry of that happier side of labour of that most ancient of all industries the husbandman's and of the generous giving of the soil set in a frame of opulently coloured woodland and sky the stately red brick and freestone house crowning the highland and looking forth upon it all the whole formed to an aurea's thinking a very noble picture and then of a sudden in the midst of her quiet enjoyment of it and a tenderness which the sight of it somehow begot in her honoria was seized by sharp unreasoning regret that she must so soon leave it unreasoning regret that she had engaged to go abroad this winter with poor pretty frivolous young lady tobermory spoilt child of society and of wealth now half crazed rendered desperate by the fear that disease which had laid a threatening finger on her might lay its whole hand cutting short her playtime and breaking her many toys of anything other than toys and playtime she had no conception those brutes of doctors tell tobermory i must give up low gowns she wrote and i adore my neck and shoulders every one always has admired them it makes me utterly miserable to cover them up and now that i am thinner i could have my gowns cut lower than ever nearly down to my waist which makes it all the more intolerable i went to desay about it went over to paris on purpose though tobermory was wild at my travelling in the heat he at desse i mean not poor t was just as nice as possible and promised to invent new styles still of course i must look dowdy at night in a high gown everybody does i shall feel exactly like our clergyman's wife at ella hay when she comes to dine with us at christmas and easter and once in the summer i refuse to have her oftener than that she has a long back and about fourteen children which she seems to think a great credit to her i don't as they're ugly and she is dreadfully poor she wears her sunday silk with lace wound about don't you know but wound tight that means full dress i am buying some lace a duchess at three and a half guineas a yard i suppose i shall come to winding that of an evening and then i shall look like her Oh, it makes me cry dreadfully and as i tell tobermory that is worse for me than any number of lungs darling h if you really love me in the least bring nothing but high gowns perhaps i mayn't mind quite so much if i never see you in a low one there had been much more to the same effect pathetic in its inadequacy and egoism 
only, as Honoria reflected, that is a style of pathos dangerously liable to pall upon one. She sighed, for the prospect of spending the winter participating in the frivolities and striving to restrain the indiscretions of this little damaged butterfly did not smile upon her. She might have stayed on here, stayed on at Brockhurst, worked over the dear place as she had done so often before, helping Lady Carmody. Why had she promised? Well, because she had been rather restless, unsettled, and at loose ends of late. Whereupon the young lady bent down and unfastened the padlock with a certain decision of movement, closed the gate, relocking it carefully behind her, and started off across the deep grass of the paddock, her pale face very serious, her small head held high. She would keep faith with Evelyn Tobermory. Of course she would keep faith with her. It was not only a matter of honour, but of expediency. It was much, very much better to go. Yet whence this sudden heat proceeded, and why the Egyptian journey assumed suddenly such paramount desirability, she carefully did not stay to inquire. An omission not, perhaps, without significance. The half-dozen dainty fillies, meanwhile, who had eyed her shyly from their station beneath the beech-trees, trotted gently towards her with friendly whinnyings, their fine ears pricked, their long tails carried well away in a sweeping curve. Honoria went on to meet them. She was glad of something to occupy her hands, some outside concrete thing to occupy her thought. She took the foremost, a dark bay, by the nose-strap of its leather headstall, patted the beast's sleek neck, looked into its prominent heavy-lidded eyes, the blue film over the velvet-like iris and pupil of them giving a singular softness of effect, drew down the fine aristocratic head, and kissed the little star where the hair turned in at the centre of the smooth hard forehead. It was as perfectly bred as she was herself so clean, so fresh, that to touch it was wholly pleasant. Then she backed away from it, holding it at arm's length, noting how every line of its limbs and body was graceful and harmonious, full of the purpose of easy strength, easy freedom of movement. That it was a trifle blown out in barrel from being at grass only gave its contours an added suavity. It was a lovely beast, a delicious beast, Honoria smiled upon it, talked to, patted, and coaxed it, while another young beauty, waxing brave, pushed its black muzzle under her arm and lipped at her jacket pockets in search of bread and of apples. And these good things once discovered, the rest of the drove came about her, civilly, a trifle proudly, as befitted such fine ladies, with no pushings and bustlings of vulgar greed, and they charmed her. She was very much at one with them. She fed them fearlessly, thrusting one aside in favour of another, giving each reward in due turn. She passed her hands down over their slender limbs. The warm colours and the gloss of them were pleasant to her eyes, and they smelt sweet as did the trampled grass beneath their unshod hoofs. For a while, the human problem, its tragedy, magnificence and inadequacy alike, ceased to trouble her. The poetry of these beautiful, innocent, clean-feeding beasts was for the moment sufficient in and by itself. But even while she thus played with and rejoiced in them, remembrance of their owner came back to her, his maiming as against their perfection of finish, the lamentable disparity between his physical equipment and theirs. Honoria's expression lost its nonchalant gaiety. She pushed her gentle equine comrades away to left and right, not that they ceased to please, but that the human problem and the tragedy of it once more became dominant. She walked on across the paddock rapidly, while the fillies forming up behind her followed in single file, treading a sinuous pathway through the grass, the foremost one still pushing its black muzzle now and again under her elbow and nibbling insinuatingly at her empty jacket pockets. Oh, if only that horrible misfortune had not befallen Richard Calmady! If, if... Oh, but then, had it not befallen him, 
would he ever have been excited to so admirable effort would he ever have attained so absorbing and vigorous a personality as he actually had again her thought turned on itself to provocation of momentary impatience honoria unfastened the second padlock with the return of her former decision there were conclusions she wished instinctively to avoid from which she instinctively desired escape she forced aside the all too affectionate bay filly who crowded upon her shot back the bar of the gate and relocked it then once again she kissed the pretty beast on the forehead as it stretched its neck over the top of the gate good-bye dear lass she said win your races and when the time comes drop foals as handsome as yourself and thank your stars you're under orders and so have small chance to muddle your affairs as with your good looks my dear you most assuredly would like all the rest of us with which excellent advice she swung away down the last twenty yards of the avenue and out on to the roadway of the red brick and freestone bridge here in the open above the water the air was sensibly fresher from the paddock the deserted fillies whinnied to her the voices of the harvesters came cheerily from the cornland the men sat in the blonde stubble backed by a range of upstanding sheaves the women bright in those frail blues clear pinks and lilacs knelt serving their meal she of the black bodice stood apart her hands upon her hips looking towards the bridge and its solitary occupant the tan and white spotted dog ran to and fro chasing field mice and yapped the baby children staggered after it uttering excited squeakings and cries the lower cloud had parted in the west disclosing an upper stratum of pale gold which widened upward and outward as the minutes passed save immediately below in the shadow of the bridge this found reflection in the water overlaying it as with the blonde of the stubble and warmer tones of the sheaves honoria sat down sideways on the coping of the parapet she watched the moorhens dark of plumage a splash of fiery orange on their jaunty little heads swim out with restless jerky motion from the edge of the reed beds and break up the shining surface with diverging lines of rippling brown shadow in the shade cast by the bridge trout rose at the dancing gnats and flies she could see them rush upward through the brown water sometimes they leapt clear of it exposing their silver bellies pink spotted sides and the olive green of their backs they dropped again with a flop and rings circled outward from the place of their disappearing all this honoria saw but dreamily pensively she realized as never before that much as she might love this place and the life of it she was a guest only a pilgrim and a sojourner the completeness of her own independence ceased to please me this uncharted freedom tires as she quoted the line honoria smiled these were indeed new aspects of herself where would they carry her both in thought and in action it was a little alarming to contemplate that and then her pensiveness increased a strange nostalgia taking her amounting almost to physical pain for that same but half disclosed glory that same new and very exquisite fullness of life apprehension of which had lately been vouchsafed to her if she could remain very still and undisturbed if she could empty her consciousness of all else bend her whole will to an act at once of determination and of reception perhaps it would be given her clearly to see and to understand the idealist the mystic were very present in honoria just then she fixed her eyes upon the shining surface of the water a conviction grew upon her that could she maintain a certain mental and emotional equilibrium something of permanent and very vital importance must take place suddenly she heard footsteps upon the gravel of the roadway she started turned deliberately holding in check the agitation which possessed her to find herself confronted by the tall pre-eminently modern and mundane figure of ludovic quayle 
Honoria gave herself a little shake of uncontrollable impatience. For less than Tupman's halfpenny, she would have given the very gentlemanlike intruder a shake too. He let her down with a bump, so to speak, from regions mysterious and supernal to regions altogether social and of this world worldly. And yet she knew that such feelings were not a little hard and unjust as entertained towards poor Mr. Quayle. The young man, in any case, was happily ignorant of having offended. He sauntered out on to the bridge, hat in hand, his head a trifle on one side, his long neck directed slightly forward, his expression that of polite and intimate amusement, but whether amusement at his own or his fellow creature's expense, it would have been difficult to declare. "'At last I find you, my dear Miss St. Quentin,' he said, "'and I have sought for you as for lost treasure.' forgive the biblical form of address a reminiscence merely of my father's morning ministrations to my unmarried sisters the footmen and the maids he reads them the most surprising little histories at times which make me positively blush but that's a detail to account for my invasion of your idyllic solitude i learned incidentally that you propose coming here from ormiston this week i thought i would venture on an early attempt to find you but I drew the house blank, though assisted by winter, the terrace also blank. Then, from the troco ground, I beheld that which looked promising, coquetting with Dicky's yearlings. So I followed on to know, my father and the maids again, followed on to, to my reward. Mr. Quayle stood directly in front of her. He spoke with admirable urbanity, yet with even greater rapidity than usual. His beautifully formed mouth pursed itself up between the sentences with that effect of indulgent superiority which was at once so attractive and so excessively provoking. But for all that, Honoria perceived that for once in his life the young man was distinctly, not to say acutely, nervous. "'The reward will be limited, I'm afraid,' she replied, "'for my temper is unaccountably out of sorts this afternoon.' "'And if one may make bold to inquire, why out of sorts, dear Miss St. Quentin?' He sat down on the parapet near her, crossed his legs and fell to nursing his left knee. The woman of the black bodice went up across the pale stubble to her companions, and she talked to them, nodding her head in the direction of the bridge. "'Oh, I have promised to do a certain thing, and having promised, of course I must do it.' Honoria looked away towards the harvesters up there among the gold of the corn. And yet now I have committed myself. Thinking it over, I find I dislike doing it warmly. Oh, the statement of the case is just a trifle vague, Mr. Quayle remarked. But if one may brave a suggestion, supersede a first duty by a second and, of course, a greater. With a little exercise of imagination, a little good will, a little assistance from a true friend thrown in, perhaps, it is generally quite possible to manage that, I think. And you are prepared to play the part of the true friend? Oh, undoubtedly. Then go to Cairo for the winter with Evelyn Tobermory. You must take no low gowns. Oh, poor little soul, it is pathetic, though. She's forbidden to wear them. And let me stay here, Honoria said. Ludovic gazed at his hands as they clasped his knee. Then he looked sideways at his companion. Here? Meaning... Meaning Brockhurst, dear Miss St. Quentin? He asked very sweetly. Meaning England, she declared. "'England! Ah, really, that pleases me better. Patriotism is an excellent virtue. The remark is not a wholly original one, but it comes in handy just now all the same.' The young lady's head went up, her face straightened. She was displeased. Turning sideways, she leaned both hands on the stonework and stared down into the water. But speedily she repented. "'See how the fish rise,' she said. "'It really is a pity one hasn't a fly-rod.' 
I was under the impression you once told me that you objected to taking life except in self-defence or for purposes of commissariat. The trout would almost certainly be muddy, and I am quite unconscious of being exposed to any danger, at least from the trout. Miss St. Quentin kept her eyes fixed upon the water. I told you my temper was out of sorts, she said. Is that a warning? Ludovic inquired, with the utmost mildness. Honoria was busy feeling in her jacket pockets. At the bottom of them a few crumbs remained. She emptied these onto the surface of the water by the simple expedient of turning the pockets inside out. I know nothing about warnings, she said. I state a plain fact. You can make of it what you please. The young man rose leisurely from his place, sauntered across the roadway and stood with his back to her, looking down the valley. The harvesters, their meal finished, moved away towards the further side of the great cornfield. The women followed them slowly, gleaning as they went. It was very quiet. And again there came to Honoria that ache of longing for the but half-disclosed glory and fullness of life. It was there, an actuality, could she but find it, had she but the courage and the wit. Then, from the open moorland beyond the park palings, came the sound of horses trotting sharply. Ludovic Quayle turned and recrossed the road. He smiled, but his superfine manner, his effect of slight impertinence, were for the moment in abeyance. "'Miss St. Quentin,' he said, what is the use of fencing any longer? I have done that which I engaged to do, namely displayed the patience of innumerable asses. And, if I may be pardoned mentioning such a thing, the years pass. Really they do, and I seem to get no forwarder. My position becomes slightly ludicrous. Oh, I know it, I know it, Honoria cried penitently. What, that I am ludicrous? Oh, no, no, she protested, that I have been unreasonable and traded on your forbearance, that I have done wrong in allowing you to wait. That you could not very well help, he said, since I chose to wait. And indeed I greatly preferred waiting as long as there seemed to be a hope there was something, anything in short, to wait for. Oh, but that is precisely what I have never been sure about myself, whether there really was anything to wait for or not. She sat straight on the coping of the parapet again. Her face bore the most engaging expression. There was a certain softness in her aspect today. She was less of a youth, a comrade, so it seemed to Mr. Quayle, more distinctly, more consciously a woman. But now, to the sound of trotting horse-hoofs was added that of wheels, and with a clang the park gates were thrown open. And are you still uncertain? In the back of your mind is there still a trifle of doubt? If so, give me the benefit of it, the young man pleaded, half laughingly and half brokenly. A carriage passed under the grey archway of the red brick and freestone lodges, Rapidly it came on down the wide, smooth, string-coloured road, a space of neatly kept turf on either side, under the shade of the heavy-foliaged elm trees. Mr. Quayle glanced at it, and paused with raised eyebrows. "'I call you to witness that I do not swear, dear Miss St. Quentin, though men have been known to become blasphemous on slighter provocation than this,' he said. However, the rather violently approaching interruption will soon be over, I hope and believe, since the driving is that of Richard Carmody of Brockhurst, when his temper, like your own, being somewhat out of sorts, he, as Jehu the son of Nimshi of old, my father's morning ministrations to the maids again, he driveth furiously. Then, with an air of humorous resignation, his mouth working a little, his long neck directed forward as in mildly surprised inquiry, he stood watching the approaching mail phaeton. The wheels of it made a hollow rumbling, the tramp of the horses was impetuous, and the pole chains rattled as it swung out onto the bridge and drew up. 
the grooms whipped down and ran round to the horses' heads, and these stood, a little extended, still and rigid as of bronze, the red of their open nostrils and the silver mountings of their harness very noticeable. Lady Carmody called to Mr. Quayle. The young man passed round at the back of the carriage, and standing on the far side of the roadway, talked with her. Honoria St. Quentin remained sitting on the parapet of the bridge. A singular disinclination to risk any movement had come upon her. Not the present situation in relation to Ludovic Quayle, but that other situation of the but half-disclosed glory, the new and exquisite fullness of life, oppressed her, penetrating her whole being to the point of physical weakness. Questioningly, yet with entire unselfconsciousness, she looked up at Richard Carmody, and he, from the exalted height of the driving seat, looked down at her. A dark cloth rug was wrapped tight around him from the waist downward. It concealed the high driving iron against which his feet rested. It concealed the strap which steadied him in his place. His person appeared finely proportioned. His head and face were surprisingly handsome, seen thus from below though it must be conceded the expression of the latter was very far from angelic. "'You were well advised to stay at home, Honoria,' he said. There was a grating tone in his voice. "'Oh, the function was even more distinguished for dullness than you expected?' "'On the contrary, it was not in the least dull. It was actively objectionable, ingeniously unpleasant, whereas this—' His face softened a little. He glanced at the golden water and cornland, the lush green of the paddock, the rich massive colouring of woodland and sky. Honoria glanced at it likewise, and so doing rose to her feet. That nostalgia of things new and glorious ached in her, yet the pain of it had a strange and intimate charm, making it unlike any pain she had ever yet felt. It hurt her very really, it made her weak, yet she would not have had it cease. "'Oh, yes, it is all very lovely, isn't it?' she said. She laid her hand on the folded leather of the carriage hood. Again she looked up. "'It is a good deal to have this, always, your own, to come back to, Richard.' She spoke sadly, almost unwillingly. Dicky did not answer but he looked down, a certain violence and energy very evident in him, his blue eyes hard, and in the depth of them desolate as the sky of a winter night. Calmly, yet in a way desperately, as those who dare inquiry beyond the range of permitted human speech, the young man and woman looked at one another. Lady Carmody's sweet voice, meanwhile, went on in kindly question, Ludovic quails in well-placed, slightly elaborate answer. The near horse threw back its head, and the pole chains rattled smartly. Honoria's lips parted, but the words, if words indeed there were, died in her throat. She raised her hands, as though putting a tangible and actual presence away from her. She did not change colour, but for the moment her delicate features appeared thickened as by a rush of blood. She was almost plain, yet the effect was inexpressively touching. It was as though she had received some mysterious injury, which she was dumb, incapable to express. She let her hands drop at her sides, turned away and walked to the far end of the bridge. Suddenly Richard's voice came to her, aggressive, curt. "'Look out, Ludovic. Stand clear of the wheel.' The horses sprang forward, the grooms scrambled up at the back, and the carriage swung away from the brightness of the open to the gloom of the avenue and up the long hill to the house. Mr. Quayle contemplated it for a minute or so, and then, with an air of amused toleration, he followed Miss St. Quentin across the bridge. "'Poor dear Dicky Carmody, poor dear Dicky,' he said. "'He attempts the impossible.' fails to attain it, as a matter of course, and meanwhile misses the possible, equally as a matter of course. It is all very magnificent, no doubt, but it is also not a little uncomfortable at times for other people. However, that trifle of criticism is, after all, beside the mark. Now that the whirlwind has ceased, Miss St. Quentin, 
May the still small voice of my own affairs presume to make itself... But there he stopped abruptly. My dear friend, he asked in quick anxiety, what is the matter? Oh, pardon me, but what on earth has happened to you? For Honoria leaned both elbows on the low carved pillar terminating the masonry of the parapet. She covered her face with her hands, and incontestably she shuddered queerly from head to foot. Wait half a second, she said in a stifled voice. It's nothing. I'm all right. Slowly she raised herself and took a long breath. Then she turned to her faithful lover, showing him a brave, if somewhat drawn and tired, countenance. Oh, Ludovic, she said gently, oh, don't, don't please let us talk any more about all that. And don't, I entreat you, wait any longer. If there was any uncertainty, if there was a doubt in the back of my mind, it's gone. Oh, forgive me, this must sound brutal, but there is no more doubt. I can't marry you. I am sorry, horribly sorry, for you have been as charming to me as a man could be, but I shall never be able to marry you. Mr. Quayle's expression retained its sweetness, even its effect of amusement, though his lips quivered and his eyelids were a little red. Oh, I do not come up to the requirements of the grand passion, he said. Alas, poor me. Oh, no, no, it isn't that, Honoria protested. Ah, then, he paused with an air of extraordinary intelligence. Perhaps someone else does. Yes, she said simply. I don't like it, but it's there, and so I've got to go through with it. Someone else does. In that case, it is indeed hopeless. I give it up, he cried. He moved aside and stood gazing at the rising trout in the golden-brown water. Then he raised his head sharply, as in obedience to a thought suddenly occurring to him, and gazed at Brockhurst House. The brightness of the western sky found reflection in its many windows. A noble cheerfulness seemed to pervade it as it crowned the hillside amid its gardens and far-ranging woods. "'By all that's—' Mr. Quayle began— but he repressed the exclamation, and his expression was wholly friendly as he returned to Miss St. Quentin. "'Good-bye,' he said. "'I am glad, honestly glad, you have found the grand passion, though the object of it can't in the first blush of the affair be altogether persona grata to myself. But to show that really I have a little root of magnanimity in me, I am quite prepared to undertake a winter at Cairo, plus evil in Tobermory and minus low dresses, if that will enable you to stay on here. I mean, in England, of course. He pursed up his beautiful mouth. He carried his head on one side with the liveliest effect of provocation as he held the young lady's hand while bidding her farewell. Out of my heart, I hope you will be very happy, he said. "'I shall never be anything but Honoria St. Quentin,' she answered rather hastily. And then she softened, forgiving him. "'Oh, why,' she said, "'why will you make me quarrel with you just now, just at the last?' "'Oh, because, because,' Mr. Quayle's voice broke, though his superior smile remained to him. "'I think I will not prolong the interview,' he said. "'To be frank with you, dear Miss St. Quentin,' I am about as miserable as is consonant with complete sanity and excellent health. I do not propose to blow my brains out, but I think, yes, thanks, you appreciate the desirability of that course of action too. I think it is about time I went. End of chapter 9 of book 6《Book Six, Chapter Ten of the History of Sir Richard Calmady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anne Fletcher, Richmond, Tasmania, 2020. The History of Sir Richard Calmady by Lucas Mallet. Book Six, Chapter Ten. Concerning a Day of Honest Warfare 
and a sunset harbinger not of the night, but of the dawn. That episode, upon the bridge spanning the long water, brought Richard, would-be saint, Richard Pilgrim along the great white road which leads onward to perfection, into lively collision with Richard the natural man, not to mention Richard the wild bull in a net. These opposing forces engaged battle, with the consequence that the carriage horses took the hill at a rather breakneck pace, not that Dicky touched them, but that he, being vibrant, they felt his mood down the length of the reins and responded to it. "'Ludovic need hardly have been in such a prodigious hurry,' he broke out. "'He might have allowed one a few days' grace. "'It was a defect of taste to come over immediately. Oh, "'But then all that family's taste is liable to lapses.' "'Promptly he repented, ashamed both of his anger "'and such self-revealing expression of it. "'I dare say it's all for the best, though. "'Better a thing should be nipped in the bud than in the blossom. "'And this puts it all on a right footing.' One might easily drift into depending too much upon Honoria. I own I was dangerously near doing that this spring. I don't mind telling you so now, mother, because this, you see, disposes finally of the matter. His voice contended oddly with the noise of the wheels and rattle of the pole chains, pounding of the hooves of the pulling horses. The sentences came to Lady Calmady's ears disjointed, difficult to follow and interpret, Therefore she answered slightly at random. "'My dearest, I could have kept her longer in the spring if I had only known,' she said, a disquieting suspicion of lost opportunity assailing her. "'But from certain things which you said, I thought you preferred our being alone.' "'For well, so I did. I wanted her to go because I wanted her to stay. Do you see?' "'Ah, oh, yes, I see.' Catherine replied, and at that moment it must be conceded her sentiments were not conspicuously pacific towards her faithful adherent, Mr. Quayle. "'We've a good many interests in common,' Dicky went on, "'and there seemed a chance of one settling down into a rather charming friendship with her. It was a beguiling prospect, and for that very reason it was best she should depart.' The prospect, in all its beguilingness, renewed itself today after luncheon. He paused, handling the plunging horses. And so, after all, Ludovic shall be reckoned welcome. For, as I say, I might have come to depend on her. And once a fool, I ought to have learnt that salutary lesson by this time. A rank fool, to depend on anybody or anything save oneself. Simply and solely oneself his tone softened, and upon you, most dear and long-suffering mother. Therefore the dream of friendship goes overboard after all, along with the rest of one's little illusions. And every illusion one rids oneself of is so much to the good. It lightens the ship. It lessens the chance of sinking. Clearly it is so much pure gain." That evening, a pleading, unexampled occurrence in her case, a headache as excuse, Miss St. Quentin did not put in an appearance at dinner, nor did Richard put in an appearance at breakfast next morning. At an early hour he had received a communication earnestly requesting his presence at the West Church Infirmary. His mission promised to be a melancholy one, yet he was not sorry for the demand made by it upon his time and thought. For, notwithstanding the philosophic tone he had adopted with Lady Carmody in speaking of that friendship which, if not nipped in the bud, might have reached perils of too luxuriant blossoming, the would-be saint and the natural man, the pilgrim on the high road to perfection, and that very inconvenient animal, the wild bull in a net, kept up warfare within Richard Carmody. They were hard at it even yet, when, in the fair freshness of the September morning, the grasses and hedge-fruit, the wild flowers, and the low-growing tangled coppices by the roadside, still heavy with dew, he drove over to Westchurch. The day was bright, with flying cloud and a westerly breeze. The dust was laid, and the atmosphere, cleared by the storm of the preceding afternoon, had a smack of autumn in it. 
it was one of those delicious yet distracting days when the sea calls and when whosoever loves seafaring grows restless must seek movement seek the open strain his eyes towards the margin of the land be the coastline never so far distant tormented by desire for sight of the blue water and the strong and naked joys of the mighty ridge and furrow where go the gallant ships with the upspringing of the wind at dawn that calling of the sea had made itself heard to richard at first it suggested only the practical temptation of putting the reprieve into commission and engaging lady carmody to go forth with him on a three or four months cruise but that as he speedily convinced himself was but a pitifully cheap expedient a shirking of voluntarily assumed responsibility a childish cheating of discontent rather than an honestly attempted cure of it if cure was to be achieved the canker must be excised boldly cut out not overlaid merely by some trifle of partially concealing plaster for he knew well enough as all sea lovers know and as he drove through the dappled sunlight and shadow frankly admitted that though the sea itself very actually and really called yet its calling was the voice and symbol of much over and above itself for in it speaks the eternal necessity of going forward that hunger and thirst for the absolute and ultimate which drives every human creature whose heart and soul and intellect are truly animate and to him just now it spoke more particularly of the natural instincts of his manhood of ambition of passion of headlong desire of sensation excitement and adventure of just all that in fact which he had forsworn had agreed with himself to cast aside and forget and thinking of this suspicion assailed him that forswearing had been slightly insincere and perfunctory he accused himself of nourishing the belief that giving he would also receive and that in kind while that any sacrifice which he offered would be returned to him doubled in value casting his bread upon the waters he accused himself of having expected to find it not after many days but immediately a full baker's dozen ready to hand in his pocket his motives had not been wholly pure actually though not at the time consciously he had essayed to strike a bargain with the almighty just as he reached the top of the long straight hill leading down into west church richard arrived at these unflattering conclusions on either side the road upon the yellow surface of which the sunlight played through the tossing leaves of the plane trees were villas of very varied and hybrid styles of architecture they were for the most part smothered in creepers and set in gardens gay with blossom below lay the sprawling red brick town blotted with purple shadow a black canal meandered through the heart of it crossed by mean hump-backed bridges the huge amorphous buildings of its railway station engine sheds goods warehouses trailing of swiftly dispersed white smoke the grime and clamour of all that its factory buildings and tall chimneys were very evident as were the pale towers of its churches and beyond the ugly pushing industrial commonplace of it striking a very different note the blue ribbon of the still youthful thames backed by high-lying chalklands fringed with hanging woods traversed a stretch of flat green meadows richard's eyes rested upon the scene absently since thought just now had more empire over him than any outward seeing for he perceived that he must cleanse himself yet further of self-seeking those words if thou wilt be perfect sell that thou hast and give to the poor and follow thou me have not a material and objective significance merely they deal with each personal desire even the apparently most legitimate with each indulgence of personal feeling even the apparently most innocent with the inward attitude and the atmosphere of the mind even more closely than with outward action and conduct and so richard reached the conclusion that he must strip himself yet nearer to the bone he must digest the harsh truth 
that virtue is its own reward, in the sense that it is its only reward, and must look for nothing beyond that. He had grown slack of late, seduced by visions of pleasant things permitted most men but to him forbidden, and wearied, too, by the length of the way and inevitable monotony of it, now first heat of enthusiasm had evaporated. Well, it was all very simple. He must just rededicate himself. And in this stern and chastened frame of mind he drove through the bustle of the country town. Saturday, market day, its streets unusually alive, nodding to an acquaintance here and there in passing, two or three of his tenant farmers, Mr. Cathcart of Newlands, in on county business, good old the octogenarian miller from Parsons Holt, and Lemuel Image the brewer, bursting out of an obviously new suit of very showy tweeds. Then, at the main door of the infirmary, helped by the stalwart hospital porter, he got down from the dog-cart, and subsequently, raked by curious eyes, saluted by hardly repressed tittering from the outpatients waiting on cue for admission to the dispensary, he made his slow way along the bare, vault-like stone passage to the accident ward, in the far corner of which a bed was shut off from the rest by an arrangement of screens and of curtains. And it was in the same chastened frame of mind that some four or five hours later Dicky entered the dining-room at Brockhurst. The two ladies had nearly finished luncheon and were about to rise from the table. Lady Carmody greeted him very gladly, but abstained from inquiry as to his doings or from comment upon the lateness of the hour, since experience had long ago taught her that of all known animals man is the one of whom it is least profitable for woman to ask questions. He was here at home, alive, intact. Her eyes were rejoiced by the sight of him. That was sufficient. If he had anything to tell her, no doubt he would tell it later. For the rest, she had something to tell him. But that too must wait till time and circumstance were propitious, since the conveying of it involved delicate diplomacies. It must be handled lightly. For the life of her she must avoid all appearance of eagerness, all appearance of attaching serious importance to the communication. Lady Carmody had learned this morning that Honoria St. Quentin did not propose to marry Ludovic Quayle. The young lady, whose charming nonchalance was curiously in eclipse today, had given her to understand so much, but very briefly, the subject evidently being rather painful to her. She was silent and a little distray, but she was also very gentle, displaying a disposition to follow Catherine about wherever she went, and a pretty zeal in doing small, odd jobs for her. Catherine was touched and tenderly amused by her manner, which was as that of a charming child coveting assurance that it need not be ashamed of itself, and that it has not really done anything naughty. But Catherine sighed, too, watching this strong, graceful, capable creature, for if things had been otherwise with Dicky, how thankfully she would have given the keeping of his future into this woman's hands. She had ceased to be jealous even of her son's love. Gladly, gratefully, would she have shared that love, accepting the second place. If only... But all that was beyond possibility of hope. Still, the friendship of which he had spoken somewhat bitterly yesterday, poor darling, remained... Ludovic Quayle's pretensions, she felt very pitifully towards that accomplished gentleman, all his good qualities had started into high relief, but his pretensions no longer barring the way to that friendship, she pledged herself to work for the promotion of it. Dicky was too severe in self-repression, was overstrained in stoicism and ignoring the fact that in his fixity of purpose, his exaggerations of self-abnegation, he proved himself very much her own son, she determined secretly, cautiously and lovingly to combat all that. It was therefore with warm satisfaction that, as Honoria was about to rise from the table, she observed Richard emerge in a degree from his abstraction, and heard him say, 
You told me you'd like to ride over to Farley this afternoon and see the home for my crippled people. Are you too tired after your headache, or do you still care to go? Oh, I'm not tired, thanks, Honoria answered. Then she hesitated, and Richard, looking at her, was aware, as on the bridge yesterday, of a sudden and singular thickening of her features, which, while marring her beauty, rendered her aspect strangely pathetic, as of one who sustains some mysterious hurt. And to him it seemed, for the moment, as though both that hurt and the infliction of it bore subtle relation to himself. Common sense discredited the notion as unpermissibly fantastic. Still, it influenced and softened his manner. Oh, but you know, you are looking frightfully done up yourself, Richard, she went on, with a charming air of half-reluctant protest. Isn't he, Cousin Catherine? Are you sure you want to ride this afternoon? Please don't go out just on my account. Oh, I'm right enough, he answered. I'd infinitely rather go out. He pushed back his chair and reached down for his crutches. Still the fantastic notion that all unwittingly he had been guilty of doing Honoria some strange injury clung to him. He was sensible of the desire to offer reparation. This made him more communicative than he would otherwise have been. "'I saw a man die this morning, that's all,' he said. "'I know it's stupid, but one can't help it. It knocks one about a bit.' You see, he didn't want to die, poor fellow. Though God knows he'd little enough to live for, or to live with, for that matter. Your factory hand, Honoria asked. Richard slipped out of his chair and stood upright. Yes, my factory hand, he answered. Dear old Knott was fearfully savage about it. He was so tremendously keen on the case, and made sure of pulling him through. But the poor boy had been sliced up a little too thoroughly. Richard paused, smiling at Honoria. So all one could do was to go with him just as far as is permitted, out into the great silence, and then... Then come home to luncheon. The home at Farley loses its point, rather, now he is dead. Still, there are others, plenty of others, enough to satisfy even Knott's greed of riveting broken human crockery. Oh, yes, I shall enjoy riding over, if you are still good to come. Four o'clock, that'll suit you. I'll order the horses. And so, in due time, the two rode forth together into the brightness of the September afternoon. The sea still called but Dickie's ears were deaf to all dangerous allurements and excitations resident in that calling. It had to him just now only the pensive charm of a far-away melody, which, though no doubt of great and immediate import to others, had ceased to be any concern of his. Beside the deathbed in the hospital ward he had renewed his vows, and the efficacy of that renewal was very present with him. It made for repose, it laid the evil spirit of defiance, of self-consciousness, of humiliation, so often obtaining in his intercourse with women, a spirit begotten by the perpetual prick of his deformity, and in part, too, by his determined adoption of the ascetic attitude in regard to the affections. He was spent by the emotions of the morning, but that also made for repose. For the time being, devils were cast out. He was tranquil, yet exalted. His eyes had a smile in them, as though they looked beyond the limit of things transitory and material, into the regions of pure idea, where the eternal values are disclosed, and peace has her dwelling. And precisely because of all this, he could take Honoria's presence lightly, be chivalrously solicitous of her entertainment and well-being, and talked to her with greater freedom than ever heretofore. He ceased to be on his guard with her, because in good truth it seemed to him there ceased to be anything to guard against. For the time being, at all events, he had got to the other side of all that, and so she and his relation to her had become part of that charming but far-away melody which was no concern of his, though mighty, great, and altogether worthy concern of others, of Ludovic Quayle, for example, and in his present tranquil humour 
he could listen to the sweetness of that melody ungrudgingly. It was pleasant. He could enjoy it without envy, though it was none of his. But to Honoria's seeing, it must be owned, matters shaped themselves very differently, for the usually unperturbed, the chaste and gallant soul of her, endured violent assaults, violent commotions, the origin of which she but partially understood. And these, Richard's frankness, his courteous, in some sort, brotherly good fellowship, served to intensify rather than allay. The feeling of the noble horse under her, the cool westerly wind in her face, went to steady her nerves and restore the self-possession, courage of judgment and clearness of thought which had been lacking to her during the past twenty-four hours. Nevertheless, she rode as through a but newly discovered country, familiar objects displaying alien aspects, familiar phrases assuming unlooked-for significance, a something challenging and fateful meeting her everywhere. The whole future seemed to hang in the balance, and she waited, dreading yet longing to see the scale turn. This afternoon the harvesters were carrying the corn. Red-painted wagons, drawn by sleek, heavy-made cart-horses, crawled slowly across the blonde stubble. It was pretty to see the rusty gold sheaves tossed up from the shining prongs of the pitchforks on to the mountainous load. Honoria and Richard watched this a little minute from the grass ride bordering the roadway beneath the elms. Next came the high-lying moorland beyond the lodges. The fine-leaved heath was thick with red-purple blossom, patches of dusky heather were frosted with dainty pink. Spikes of genista and beds of needle firs showed sharply yellow and vividly green, and a fringe of blue campanula with frail, quivering bells outlined all open spaces. The face of the land had been washed by the rain. It shone with an inimitable cleanliness, as though consciously happy in relief from all soil of dust. And it was here, the open country stretching afar on all sides, that Dickie began talking, not as at first in desultory fashion, but of matters nearly pertaining and closely interesting to himself. "'You know,' he said as they walked the horses quietly, neck to neck along the moorland road, "'I don't go in for system-making or for reforms on any big scale. That doesn't come within my province. I must leave that to politicians and to men who are in the push of the world.' I admire it. I rejoice in the hot-headed, narrow-brained, whole-hearted agitator who believes that his system adopted, his reform carried through, the whole show will instantly be put straight. Such faith is very touching. And the reformer has sometimes done some little good after all, Honoria commented. Oh, of course he has, Richard agreed. Only, as a rule, poor dear, he can't be contented but that his special reform should be the final one, that his system should be the universal panacea. And in point of fact, no reform is final this side of death, and no panacea is universal, save that which the maker of the universe chooses to work out, is working out now if we could in any way grasp it, through the slow course of unnumbered ages. Let the reformer do all he can, but don't let him turn sour because his pet reform, his pet system, sinks away and is swallowed up in the great sea of things, sea of human progress, if you like. Every system is bound to prove too small, every reform ludicrously inadequate, be it never so radical, because material conditions are perpetually changing while man, in his mental, emotional and physical aspects, remains always precisely the same. They passed from the breezy upland into the high bank lane, which, leading downwards, joins the great London and Portsmouth road just beyond Farley Row. And, and that is where I come in, Richard said, turning a little in the saddle and smiling sweet-temperedly, yet with a suggestion of self-mockery upon his companion. Just because, in essential respects, mankind remains, notwithstanding modifications of his environment, substantially the same, from the era of the Pentateuch to the era of the Rugon Makwarts, 
There must always be a lot of wreckage, of waste and refuse humanity. The inauguration of each new system, each new reform, religious, political, educational, economic, practically they're all in the same boat. Let alone the inevitable breakdown or petering out of each necessarily produces a fresh crop of such waste and refuse material. And in that, a man like myself, who does not aspire to cure or to construct, but merely to alleviate and to pick up the pieces, finds his chance. And Honoria listened, musing, approved, enthusiasm gaining her, yet protested, since even while she admired, she rebelled a little on his account, and for his sake. "'Oh, but it is rather a hard life, surely, Richard,' she said, "'which you propose to yourself. "'Always the pieces, the thing broken and spoiled, "'never the thing in its beauty, full of promise and whole.' "'Oh, it is less hard for me than for most,' he answered, "'or should be so. "'After all, I am to the manner born, "'a bit of human wreckage myself,' with which, but for the accident of wealth, things would have gone pretty badly. I used to be horribly scared sometime as a small boy, thinking to what uses I might be put if the kindly golden rampart ever gave. He became silent. As for Honoria, she had neither courage to look at nor answer him just then. "'And you see I'm absolutely free,' he added presently. I am alone, always shall be so. If the life is hard, I ask no one to share it, so I may make it what I like. Oh, no, oh, no, you misunderstand, Richard. I didn't mean that, Honoria cried quickly, half under her breath. Again he looked at her, smiling. Didn't you? All the kinder of you, he said. Thereupon regret, almost intolerable in its poignancy, invaded Miss St. Quentin that she would have to go away, to go back to the world and all the foolish obtaining fashions of it, that she would have to take that preeminently well-cushioned and luxurious winter's journey to Cairo. She longed inexpressibly to remain here, to assist in these experiments made in the name of holy charity, she longed inexpressibly to and there honoria paused even in thought yet she glanced at the young man riding beside her at the handsome profile still and set in outline the suggestion it was no more of a scar running downward across the left cheek at the well-made upright broad-shouldered figure and then at the saddle peaked back and front with oddly shaped appendages to it resembling old-fashioned holsters and as yesterday upon the bridge the ache of a pain at once sweet and terrible laid hold of her making her queerly faint the single street sun-covered sleepy empty save for a brewer's dray and tax cart or two standing before the solid georgian portals of the white lion inn for a straggling tale of children bearing home small shoppings and jugs of supper beer, for a flock of grey geese proceeding with suggestively self-righteous demeanour along the very middle of the roadway and lowering long necks to hiss defiance at the passer-by, and for an old black retriever dozing peacefully beneath one of the rustling sycamores in front of Josiah Appleyard, the saddler's shop. All these, as she looked at them, became uncertain in outline, reeled before Honoria's eyes. For the moment she experienced a difficulty in keeping steady in the saddle, but the horses still walked quietly, neck to neck, their shadows and those of their riders growing longer and narrower, outstretched before them as the sun declined in the west. All the future hung in the balance, but the scale had not turned as yet. Then Richard's voice took up its parable again. Perhaps it's a rather fraudulently comfortable doctrine. Yet it does strike one that the justification of disaster in all its many forms is the opportunity it affords the individualist. He may use it for self-aggrandisement or for self-devotion, though I rather shy at so showy a word as that last. However, the use he makes of it isn't the point. 
What is the point, to my mind at least, is this, though it doesn't sound magnificent, it hardly indeed sounds cleanly, that whatever trade fails, whatever profession, thanks to the advance of civilization, becomes obsolete, that of the man with the dust-cart, of the scavenger, of the sweeper, won't. Once more Richard smiled upon his companion charmingly, yet with something of self-mockery. "'And so, you see, having knocked about enough to grow careless of niceties of prejudice, and to acquire immense admiration for any vocation which promises permanence, I join hands with the dustman. In the light of science and in that of religion alike, nothing really is common or unclean. And then, then if you are outcasted in any case, as some of us are, it's a little too transparently cheap to be afraid of soiling. He broke off. Away there to the left, Honoria, he said. You see the house? The yellow-washed one with the gables and tiled roof? There, back on the slope. Bagshaw, the Bond Street poulterer, had it for years. His lease ran out in the spring, and happily he didn't care to renew. Had bought himself an up-to-date villa residence somewhere in the suburbs. Chislehurst, I believe. So I took the place over. It will do for a beginning, the small end of the wedge of my scavenger's business. There are over five acres of garden and orchard, and plenty of rooms on each floor, which gives good range for the disabled to move about in, and the stairs, only one flight, are easy. One has to think of these details. And, well, the house commands a magnificent view of Clark's Green and the geese on it, than which nothing clearly can be more exciting. The groom rode forward and opened the gate. Before the square outstanding porch, Richard drew up. I should like to come in with you, he said, but you see it's rather a business getting off one's horse, and I can't very well manage the stairs, so I'll wait about till you're ready. Don't hurry. I want you to see all the arrangements, if it doesn't bore you, and make suggestions. The carpenters are there, doing overtime. They'll let you through if the caretaker's out. Thus admonished, Miss St. Quentin dismounted and made her way into the house. A broad passage led straight through it. The open door at the farther end disclosed a vista of box-edged paths and flower borders, where, in gay ranks, stood tall sunflowers, hollyhocks, Michaelmas daisies, and such like. Beyond was orchard, the round-headed apple trees, bright with polished fruit, rising from a carpet of grass. The rooms, to the left and right of the passage, were pleasantly sun-warmed and mellow of aspect, the ceilings of them crossed by massive beams. Honoria visited them, dutifully observant. She encountered the head carpenter, an acquaintance and ally during those four years so great a part of which she had spent at Brockhurst. She talked with him, making inquiries concerning wife, children and trade incident to such a meeting, her face very serious all the while, the skirt of her habit gathered up in one hand, her gait a trifle stiff and measured owing to her high riding boots. But though she acquitted herself in all kindliness of conversation, though she conscientiously inspected each separate apartment and noted the cheerful comeliness of orchard and garden, it must be owned all these remained singularly distant from her actual emotion and thought. She was glad to be alone. She was glad to be away from Richard Carmody, though zealously obedient to his wishes in respect of this inspection, for his presence became increasingly oppressive from the intensity of feeling it produced in her, and which she was at present powerless to direct towards any reasonable and definite end. This rendered her tongue-tied, and, as she fancied, stupid. Her unreadiness mortified her. She, usually indifferent enough to the impression she produced on others, was sensible of a keen desire to appear at her best, she did, in fact, so she believed, appear at her worst, slow of understanding and of sympathy. But then all the future hung in the balance. The scale delayed to turn, and the strain of waiting became agitating to the point of distress. 
At last the course of her so dutiful survey brought her to a quaint little chamber, situated immediately over the square outstanding porch. It was lighted by a single hooded window placed in the centre of the front wall. It was evidently designed for a linen room, and was in process of being fitted with shelves and cupboards of white pine. The floor was deep in shavings, long, curly, wafer-coloured, semi-transparent. They rustled like fallen leaves when Honoria stepped among them. The air was filled with the odour of them, dry and resinous as that of the fir forest. Ever after, that odour affected Honoria with a sense of half-fearful joy and of impending fate. She stood in the middle of the quaint little chamber. The ceiling was low. She had to bend her head to avoid violent contact between the central beam of it and the crown of her felt hat. But, circumscribed though the space, and uncomfortable though her posture, she had an absurd longing to lock the door of the little room, never to come out and to stay here for ever. Here she was safe, but outside, on the threshold, stood something she dared not name. It drew her with a pain at once terrible and lovely. She dreaded it. Yet once close to it, once face to face with it, she knew it would have her, that it would not take no for an answer. Her pride, her chastity, were in arms. Was this, she wondered, what men and women speak of so lightly, laugh and joke about? Was this love? To her it seemed wholly awe-inspiring, and so she clung strangely to the shelter of the quaint little room with its sea of rustling, resinous shavings. On the other side, the door of it, waited that momentous decision which would cause the scale to turn. Yet the minutes passed. To prolong her absence became impossible. Just then there was a movement below, a crunching of the gravel, as though of a horse growing restless, impatient of standing. Honoria moved forward, opened the window, pushing back the casement against a cluster of late blossoming red roses, the petals of which floated slowly downward, describing fluttering circles. Richard Carmody was just below. Honoria called to him. "'I'm coming, Richard. I'm coming,' she said. He turned in the saddle and looked up at her, smiling, a smile at once courageous and resigned. Yet notwithstanding that smile, Honoria once again discovered in his eyes the chill desolation and homelessness of the sky of the winter night. Then the scale turned, turned at last, for that same lovely pain grew lovelier, more desirable than any possibility of ease, until such time as that desolation should pass, that homelessness be cradled to content in some sure harbourage. Here was the thing given her to do, and she must do it. She would risk all to win all, and with that decision all her serenity and freedom of soul returned. The white light of a noble self-devotion, reckless of self-spending, reckless of consequence, the joy of a great giving, illuminated her face. As to Richard, he, looking up at her, though ignorant of her purpose, misreading the cause of that inspired aspect, still thought he had never witnessed so graciously gallant a sight. The nymph whom he had first known, who had baffled and crossed him, was here still, strong, untamed, elusive and remote. But a woman was here too, of finest fibre, faithful and loyal, capable of undying tenderness, of an all-encircling and heroic love. Then the desires of the natural man stirred somewhat in Richard, just because, paradox though it undoubtedly was, she provoked less the carnal, perishing passion of the flesh than the pure and imperishable passion of the spirit. Irrepressible envy of Ludovic Quayle, her lover, seized him, irrepressible demand for just all those things which that other Richard, the would-be saint, had so sternly condemned himself to repudiate, to cast aside and forget. And the would-be saint triumphed, beating down thought of all that, trampling it underfoot, so that after briefest interval he called up to her cheerily enough. "'Well, what do you make of the dust-cart?' 
Rather fascinating, isn't it? Notwithstanding its uncleanly name, it's really rather sweet. To which she answered, speaking from out the wide background of her own emotion and purpose. Yes, yes, it's sad in a way, Richard. Penetratingly, splendidly sad. But one wouldn't have it otherwise. For it is splendid, and it is sweet. Abundantly sweet. Then her tone changed. I won't keep you waiting any longer. I'm coming, she said. Honoria looked round the quaint little room, with its half-adjusted shelves and cupboards, the floor of it deep in resinous, semi-transparent, wafer-coloured shavings, bidding it adieu. For good or evil, happiness or sorrow, she was sensible it told for much in her life's history. And then, something delicately militant in her carriage, she swung away downstairs and out of the house. She was going forth to war, indeed, to a war which in no shape or form had she ever waged as yet. Many men had wooed her, and their wooing had left her cold. She had never wooed any man. Why should she? To her no man had ever mattered one little bit. So she mounted and they rode away. A spin across the level turf to hearten her up, satisfy the fullness of sensation which held her and shake her nerves into place. It was exhilarating. She grew keen and tense, her whole economy becoming reliable and well-knit by the strong exercise and sense of the superbly healthy and unperplexed vitality of the horse under her. Honoria could have fought with dragons just then, had such been there to fight with. But in point of fact, nothing more aggressively dangerous presented itself for encounter than the shallow ford which divides the parish of Farley from that of Sandyfield and the tithing of Brockhurst. Snorting a little, the horses splashed through the clear brown water and entered upon the rough rutted road, grass grown in places, which, ending beneath a broken avenue of ancient stag-headed oaks, leads to the entrance of Brockhurst Woods. These, crowned by the dark ragged line of the fir forest, rose in a soft dense mass against the western sky, in which showed promise of a fair pageant of sunset. A covey of partridges ran up the sandy ruts before the horses, and rising at last with a long-drawn whir of wings, skimmed the top of the crumbling bank and dropped in the stubble field on the right. A pause, while the keeper's wife ran out to open the white gate. The dogs, meanwhile, from their wooden kennels under the Spanish chestnuts upon the hillock behind the lodge, pulling at their chains and keeping up a vociferous chorus. Thus heralded, the riders passed into the mysteriously whispering quiet of the great woods. The heavy summer foliage remained as yet untouched by the hectic of autumn. Diversity was observable in form rather than in tint, and from this resulted a remarkable effect of unity, a singleness of intention and a far-reaching secrecy. The multitudinous leaves and the all-pervading green gloom of them, around, above, seemed to engulf horses and riders. It was as though they rode across the floor of the ocean, the green tides sweeping overhead. Yet the trees of the wood asserted their intelligent presence now and again. Audibly they talked together, bent themselves a little to listen and to look, as though curious of the aspect and purposes of these wandering mortals. And all this, the unity and secrecy of the place, affected both Richard and Honoria strangely, circling them about with something of earth magic, removing them far from ordinary conditions of social intercourse, and thus rendering it possible, inevitable even, that they should think such thoughts and say such words as part company with subterfuge and concealment, go naked and speak uttermost truth. For with only the trees of the woods to listen, with that sibilant whisper of the green tide overhead, with strong emotion compelling them, in the one case towards death of self, in the other towards giving of self, in the one towards austere passivity, in the other towards activity taxing all capital of pride, of delicacy and of tact, developments became imminent and those of the most vital sort. The conversation had been broken, desultory, but now by tacit consent 
the pace became quiet again, the horses were permitted to walk. To have gone other than softly through the living heart of the greenwood must have savoured of desecration. Yet Richard was not insensible to a certain danger. He tried, rousing himself to conversation, to rouse himself also to the practical and commonplace. "'I am glad you liked my house,' he said. "'But I hear the aristocracy of the row laments. "'It shies at the idea of being invaded by more or less frightful creatures. "'But I remain deaf. I really can't bother about that. "'It is so immeasurably more unpleasant to be frightful than to see that which is so "'that I am afraid my sympathies remain rather pig-headedly one-sided.' I propose to educate the row in the grace of pity. It may lay up merit by due exercise of that. Richard took off his hat and rode bareheaded, looking away into the delicious green gloom. Here, where the wood was thickest, oak and beech shutting out the sky, clasping hands overhead, the ground beneath them deep in moss and fern, that gloom was precisely like the colour of Honoria's eyes. He wished it wasn't so, he tried to forget it, but the resemblance haunted him. Look where he might, still he seemed to look into those singular and charming eyes. He talked on determinedly, putting a force upon himself, too often saying that which no sooner was it out of his mouth than he wished unsaid. "'I don't want to be too hard on the row, though. It has a right, after all, to its little prejudices.' Only, you see, for those who, poor souls, are different to other people, it becomes of such supreme importance to keep in touch with the average. I have found that out in practice. And so I refuse to shut my waste humanity away. They must neither hide themselves nor be hidden, be spared seeing how much other people enjoy from which they are debarred, or grow over-conscious of their own ungainliness." That is why I've planted them, and their gardens, and their pigs, and their poultry. We'll have a lot of livestock, a second generation even of chickens, offers remarkable consolations. Planted them on the high road, at the entrance of the little town, where on a small scale at all events, they'll see the world that's straight-backed, and has its proper complement of limbs and senses, go by. Envy, hatred and malice, and the seven devils of morbidity are forever lying in wait for them, well, for us, for me and those like me, I mean. In proportion as one's brought up tenderly, as I was, one doesn't realise the deprivation and disgust of one's condition at the start. But one's realised. One's inclination is to kill. At least a man's is. A woman may accept it more quietly, I suppose. "'Richard,' Honoria said slowly, "'are you sure you don't greatly exaggerate all... all that?' He shook his head. "'Oh, thirty years' experience? No, I don't exaggerate. Each time one makes a fresh acquaintance, each time a pretty woman is just that bit kinder to one than she would dare be to any man who was not out of it.' Each time people are manifestly interested, oh, politely, of course, and form a circle, make room for one, as they did at that particularly disagreeable Grimshot garden party yesterday. Each time, I don't want to drivel, but so it is, one sees a pair of lovers. Oh, well, it's not easy to retain one's philosophy, not to obey the primitive instincts of any animal when it's ill-used and hurt, and to revenge oneself. "'to want to kill, in short. "'Oh, you... you don't hate women, then?' "'Honoria said, still slowly. "'Richard stared at her for a moment. "'Hate them,' he said. "'I only wish to goodness I did.' "'Oh, but in that case,' she began bravely, "'why...' "'This is why,' he broke in, you may remember my engagement to Lady Constance Quayle, and the part you very properly took in the cancelling of it. You know better than I do, though my imagination is pretty fertile in dealing with the situation, what instincts and feelings prompted you to take that part. The young lady turned to him, her arms outstretched, 
notwithstanding bridle reins and whip, her face and those strange eyes which seemed so integral a part of the fair green wood, full of sorrowful entreaty and distress. "'Oh, Richard, Richard!' she cried. "'Will you never forgive me that? She didn't love you. It was horrible. Yet in doing that which I did, I believe, I believe so still, I did what was right by you both.' Oh, undoubtedly you did right, and that justifies my contention. In doing that which you did, you gave voice to the opinion of all wholesome-minded people. That's exactly where it is. You felt the whole business to be outrageous. So it was. I heartily agree. He paused, and the trees talked softly together, bending down a little to listen and to look. As you say, she wasn't in love. Poor child, how could she be? No woman ever will be, at least not in love of the nobler sort, of the sort which, if one cannot have it, one had a vast deal better have no love at all. Oh, but I'm not so sure of that, Honoria said stoutly. You rush to conclusions. Isn't it rather a reflection on all the rest of us to take Lady Constance as the measure of the insight and sensibility of the whole sex? And then she had already lost all her innocent little heart to Captain Dacia. Indeed, you're not fair to us. Wait. Like Ludovic Quayle? Miss St. Quentin straightened herself in the saddle. Oh, dear, no. Not the least like Ludovic Quayle, she said. Which enigmatic reply produced silence for a while on Dickie's part, for there were various ways in which it might be interpreted, some flattering, some eminently unflattering, to himself. And from every point of view, it was wisest to accept that last form of interpretation. The whole conversation had been perilous in character. It had been too intimate, had touched him too nearly, taking place here in the clear glooms of the green wood, moreover, which bore such haunting kinship to those singularly sincere and yet mysterious eyes. It is dangerous to ride across the floor of ocean, with the whispering tide sweeping overhead, and in such gallant company. Besides, that to ride thus for ever could hardly come amiss. Richard, in his turn, straightened himself up in the saddle, opened his chest, taking a long breath, carried his head high, said a stern, get thee behind me, Satan, to encroaching sentiment and emotion, and to those fair visions which his companion's presence and her somewhat daring talk had conjured up. He defied the earth magic, defied those sylvan deities who, as he divined, sought to enthrall him. For the moment he confounded Honoria's influence with theirs. It was something of a battle, and not the first one he had fought to-day for the great white road which leads onward to perfection looked dusty and arid enough. No reposeful shadow, no mystery, no beguiling green glooms over it. Stark, straight and hard, it stretched on endlessly, as it seemed, ahead. To travel it was slow and tedious work in any case, and to travel it on crutches. But it was worse than useless to play with such thoughts as these. He would put a stop to this disintegrating talk. He turned to Honoria and spoke lightly, with a return of self-mockery. "'Oh, your first instinct was the true one, depend upon it,' he said, "'though I don't deny it contributed indirectly to giving me a pretty rough time.' "'Oh, dear me!' Honoria cried, almost piteously. Then she added, "'But I don't see. Why was that?' Oh, because I suppose I had a sort of unwilling belief in you, he said, smiling. Oh, this accursed conversation! Why would it insistently drift back into intimacy thus? Have I justified that belief? she asked, with a certain pride, yet a certain eagerness. Oh, more than justified it, Dickie answered. My mother, who has a touchstone for all that is of high worth, knew you from the first. Like the devils, I believed and trembled. At least that is how I see it all now. So your action came as a rather searching revelation and condemnation. When I perceived all that it involved, 
<laughs> well, first I went to the dogs, and then... The horses walked side by side. Honoria stretched out her hand impulsively, laid it on his arm. Oh, Richard, Richard, for pity's sake, don't. You hurt me too much. It's terrible to have been the cause of such suffering. Oh, you weren't the cause, he said. Lies were the cause, behind which, like a fool, I tried to shelter myself. You've been right, Honoria, from first to last. What does it matter, after all? Don't take it to heart. For it's over now, all over, thank God, and I have got back into normal relations with things and with people. He looked at her very charmingly and spoke with a fine courtesy of tone. One way and another you have taught me a lot, and I am grateful. And in the future, though the conditions will be altered, I hope you'll come back here often, Honoria, and just see for yourself that my mother is content, and give my schemes and fads a kindly look in at the same time. And perhaps give me a trifle of sound advice. I shall need it safe enough. You see, what I want to get at is temperance temperance all round towards everything and everybody not fanaticism which in some respect is a much easier attitude of mind richard looked up into the whispering green tide overhead yes one must deny oneself the luxury of fanaticism if possible he said deny oneself the vanity of eccentricity one must take everything simply just in the day's work one must keep in touch, keep in touch with your world, the great world, the world which cultivates pleasure and, incidentally, makes history, as well as with the world of the dust cart. I know that well enough, if one's to be quite sane. You see, loneliness, a loneliness of which I am thankful to think you can form no conception, is the curse of persons like myself. It inclines one to hide, to sulk, to shut oneself away and become misanthropic. To hug one's misery becomes one's chiefest pleasure. To nurse one's grief, one's sense of injury. Oh, I'm wary, very wary now, I tell you, he added, half laughing. I know all the insidious temptations, the tricks and frauds and pitfalls of this affair. And so I'll continue to go to Grimshot garden parties as discipline now and then, while I gather my disabled and decrepit family very closely about me, and say words of wisdom to it, wisdom derived from a mature and extensive personal experience. There was a pause before Miss St. Quentin spoke. Then she said slowly, And you refuse to let anyone help? You, you refuse to let anyone share the cares of that disabled family? Again Dicky stared at her, arrested by her speech and doubtful of the intention of it. He could have sworn there were tears in her voice, that it trembled. But her face was averted, and he could see no more than the slightly angular outline of her cheek and chin. Isn't that a rather superfluous question? he remarked. As you pointed out a little while ago, mine is not a superabundantly cheerful programme. No one would volunteer for such service, at least no one likely to be acceptable to my mother, or indeed likely to satisfy my own requirements. I admit I am a little fastidious, a little critical and exacting when it comes to close quarters and, well, permanent association, even yet. I'm very glad to hear that, Honoria said. Her face remained averted, but there was a change in her attitude, a decision in the pose of her figure, suggestive both of challenge and of triumph. Richard was nonplussed, but his blood was up. This conversation had gone far enough, indeed too far. Very certainly he would make an end of it. Oh, but God forbid, he exclaimed, that I should ever fall to such a depth of selfishness as to invite any person who would satisfy my taste, my demands, to share my life. I mayn't amount to very much, 
but at least I have never used my personal ill luck to trade on a woman's generosity and pity. What I have had from women I've paid for in hard cash. In that respect my conscience is clear. It has been a bargain, fair and square and above board, and all my debts are settled in full. You hardly think at this time of day I should use my proposed schemes of philanthropy as a bait? Richard sent his horse forward at a sharp trot. Oh, no, no, Honoria, he said. Let it be understood. That side of things is over for ever. But here came relief from the green glooms of the greenwood and the dangerous magic of them, for the riders had reached the summit of the hill and entered upon the levels of the great tableland at the head of which Brockhurst House stands. Here was the open, the fresh breeze, the long-drawn, sighing song of the fir forest, a song more austere, more courageous and more virile than ever sung by the trees of the wood which dropped their leaves for fear of the sharp-toothed winter and only put them forth again beneath the kisses of soft-lipped spring. Covering all the western sky were lines of softly rounded broken cloud, rank behind rank in endless perspective, the whole shaped like a mighty fan. The underside of them was flushed with living rose, the clear spaces behind them paved with sapphire at the zenith and pale as topaz where they skirted the far horizon. "'Oh, how very beautiful it is!' Honoria cried joyously. "'Richard, let us see this!' She turned her horse at the green ride which leads to the white temple situate on that outstanding spur of hill. She rode on quickly till she reached the platform of turf before the temple. Richard followed her with deliberation. He was shaken. His calm was broken up, his whole being in tumult. Why had she pressed just all those matters home on him which he had agreed with himself to cast aside and forget? It was a little cruel, surely, that temptation should assail him thus, and the white road towards perfection be made so difficult to tread, just when he had rededicated himself and renewed his vows. He looked after her. It was here he had met her first, after the time when, as a little maid, she had proved too swift of foot, leaving him so far behind that it sorely hurt his baby dignity and caused him to see her depart without regret. She was still swift of foot. She left him behind now. For the moment he was ready to swear that not only without regret but with actual thankfulness he could again witness her departure. Yes, he wanted her to go, because he so desperately wanted her to stay. That was the truth. For not only Dicky the natural man, but Dicky the wild bull in a net had a word to say just then. Oh, God in heaven, what hard work it is to be good. Miss St. Quentin kicked her left foot out of the stirrup, threw her right leg over the pommel, turned and slipped straight out of the saddle. She stood there, a somewhat severely tall, dark figure, strong and positive in effect, against the immense and reposeful landscape, far-ranging purple distance, golden harvest fields, silver glint of water in the hollows, all the massive grandeur of the woods and that superb pageant of sunset sky. The groom rode forward, took her horse and led it away to the far side of the grass platform behind the temple. Those ranks of rosy cloud in infinite perspective, with spaces of clearest topaz and sapphire light between, converged to the glowing glory of the sun, the rim of which now touched the margin of the world. They were as ranks of worshippers, of blessed souls redeemed and sainted, united by a common act of adoration, every form clothed by reflection of his glory, every heart, every thought, centred upon God. Richard looked at all that, but it failed to speak to him. Then he saw Honoria resolutely turn her back upon the glory. She came directly towards him. Her face was very thin, her manner very calm. She laid her left hand on the peak of his saddle. She looked him full in the eyes. 
Richard, she said, be patient a minute and listen. It comes to this, that a woman, your equal in position, of your own age and not without money, does volunteer to share your work. It's no forlorn hope. She is not disappointed. On the contrary, she has and can have pretty well all the world's got to give. Only, perhaps very foolishly, for she doesn't know much about the matter, having been rather cold-blooded as yet, she has fallen in love. There was a silence, save that the wind came out of the west, out of the majesty of the sunset, and with it came the calling of the sea, not only of the blue water or of those green tides that sweep above wandering mortals in the magic greenwood, but of the sea of faith, of the sea of love, love human, love divine, love universal, which circles not only this, but all possible states of being, all possible worlds. Presently Richard spoke hoarsely, under his breath. With whom? he said. With you. Dicky went white to the lips. He sat absolutely still for a little space, his hands resting on his thighs. Tell her to think, he said at last. She proposes to do that which the world will condemn, and rightly from its point of view. It will misread her motives. It won't spare disagreeable comment. Tell her to think. Tell... tell her to look. Cripple and dwarf, the last as he ought to be of an unlucky race. A man who's carried up and down stairs like an infant, who's strapped to the saddle, strapped to the driving seat, who is cut off from most forms of activity and of sport. A man who will never have any sort of career, who has given himself, in expiation of past sins, to the service of human beings a degree more unfortunate than himself. No, no, stop, hear me out. She must know it all. A man who has lived far from cleanly, who has evil memories and evil knowledge of life. No, listen. A man whom you, yes, you yourself, Honoria, have condemned bitterly, from whom, notwithstanding your splendid nerve and pluck, so repulsive is his deformity, you have shrunk a hundred times. She has thought of all that, Honoria answered calmly, but she has thought of this, too, that going up and down the world to find the most excellent thing in it, she has found this thing, love. And so to her, Richard, your crippling has come to be dearer than any other man's wholeness. Your wrongdoings, may God forgive her, dearer than any other man's virtues. Your virtues so wholly beautiful that, oh, that... The tears came into her eyes, her lips quivered, and she backed away a little from rider and horse. Richard, she cried fiercely, if you don't care for me, if you don't want me... Be honourable. Tell me so straight out, and let us have done with it. I'm strong enough. I'm man enough for that. For heaven's sake, don't take me out of pity. I would never forgive you. There's a good deal of us both, one way and another, and we should give each other a hell of a time if I was in love and you were not. Oh, but... She put her hand on the peak of that very ugly saddle again. But if you do care, here I am. I have never failed anyone yet. I will never fail you. I'm yours, body and soul. Marry me, she said. End of chapter 10 of book 6book 6 chapter 11 of the history of Sir Richard Calmady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anne Fletcher, Richmond, Tasmania, 2020. The History of Sir Richard Carmody by Lucas Mallet. Book 6, Chapter 11, in which Richard Carmody bids the long-suffering reader farewell. The midsummer dusk had fallen, drawing its soft, dim mantle over the face of the land. The white light walked the northern sky from west to east. A nightingale sang in the big Portugal laurel at the corner of the troco ground, 
and was answered by another singer from the coppice across the valley, bordering the trout stream that feeds the long water. A fox barked sharply out in the warren. Beetles droned, flying conspicuously upright, straight on end, through the warm air. The churring of the night jars, as they flitted hither and thither, over the beds of bracken and dog roses, like gigantic moths on quick silent wings, formed a continuous accompaniment, as of a spinning wheel, to the other sounds and Dick Ormiston laughed consumedly, doubling himself together now and again, and holding his slim sides in effort to moderate his explosive merriment. He was in uproarious spirits, back from school today, and that nearly a month earlier than could by the most favourable process of calculation have been anticipated, thanks to development of measles on the part of some much-to-be-commended schoolfellows. How he blessed those praiseworthy young sufferers! And how he laughed, watching the two heavy-headed, lolloping, half-grown bulldog puppies describe crazy circles upon the smooth turf in the deepening dusk. Seen thus in the half-light, they appeared more than ever gnome-like, humorously ugly and awkward. They trod on their own ears, tumbled over one another, sprawled on the grass, panting and grinning, until their ecstatic owner incited them to further gyrations. To Dick this was a night of unbridled license. Had he not dined late? Had he not leave to sit up till half-past ten o'clock? Was he not going out, bright and early, tomorrow morning, to see the horses galloped? Could life hold greater complement of good for a brave little ten-year-old soul and a slender, serviceable little ten-year-old body, emulous of all manly virtues and manly pastimes? So the boy laughed, and the sound of his laughter reached the ears both of the elder and the younger Lady Carmody, as they slowly paced the straight walk between the grey balustrade and the edge of the turf. On their left, the great outstretch of valley and wood lay drowned in the suave uncertainties of the summer night. Before them was the whole terrace front of the house, its stacks of twisted chimneys clear-cut against the sky. Bright light shone out from the windows of the red drawing-room and from those of the hall, bringing flowers, sections of grey pavement and like details into sharp relief. There were passing lights in the range of windows above, suggesting cheerful movement within the great house. At the southern end of the terrace, just below the arcade of the garden hall, which showed pale against the shadow within and brickwork above, two men were sitting. Their voices reached the ladies now and then in quiet yet animated talk. A spirit of peace, of security, of firmly planted hope seemed to pervade all the scene, all the place. Waking or sleeping, fear was banished. All was strong to work tomorrow, so tonight all could calmly yield itself to rest. And it was a sense of just this, and a tender anxiety, lest the fullness of the gracious content of it should be in any degree marred to her dear companion, which made Honoria Carmody say presently, "'You don't mind little Dick's racketing with those ridiculous puppies, do you, Cousin Catherine?' If it bothers you, I'll stop him like a shot. But Catherine shook her head. My dearest child, why stop him? she said. The foolishnesses of young creatures at play are delicious, and laughter, so long as it is not cruel, I reckon among the good gifts of God. She paused a moment. Dear Marie de Mirancourt tried to teach me that long ago but I was culpably dull of hearing in those days where spiritual truth was concerned, and I failed to grasp her meaning. I believe we never really love either man or Almighty God until we can both laugh ourselves and let others laugh. Of all false doctrines, that of the sour-faced, joyless Puritan is the falsest. His mere outward aspect is a sin against the Holy Ghost. And Honoria smiled, patting the hand which lay on her arm very tenderly. "'Oh, how I love your heavenly rage!' she said. They moved on a few steps in silence, and then, careless of all the rapture its notification of the passing of time might cut short, the clock at the house stables chimed the half-hour. Honoria paused in her gentle walk. "'Bedtime, Dick!' she cried. "'All right,' the boy returned. 
he pursued and laid hold of the errant puppies stowing them not without kickings and strugglings on their part one under either arm they were large and heavy just as much as he could carry and he staggered across the grass with them presenting the effect of a small black donkey between a pair of very big white panniers i say they are awfully stunning though you know honoria he said rather breathlessly as he came up to her very soul-satisfying aren't they dick she replied richard foresaw as much that is why he got them for you if i put them down do you suppose they'll follow carrying them does make my arms ache oh they'll follow fast enough honoria said he lowered the puppies circumspectly on to the gravel they'll be whoppers when they're grown he remarked and what shall you call them adam and eve i think because they're the first of my lot they're pedigree dogs and later i may want to show don't you see oh yes i see honoria said he came close to her putting his face up half shyly to be kissed then as young lady carmody somewhat ghostly in her trailing white evening dress bent her charming head the boy suddenly overcome with the manifold excitements of the day flung his arms round her oh oh he gasped how awfully ripping it is to be back here again with you and cousin richard and aunt catherine i wish number four dormitory would get the measles the middle of every term only i forgot perhaps i ought not to touch you honoria after messing about with the dogs do you mind not a bit she said oh, but honoria he rubbed his cool cheek against her bare neck i say don't you think you might come and see me just for a little weeny while after i'm in bed tonight and young lady carmody thus coaxed held the slight figure close she had a very special place in her heart for this small dick who in face and as she hoped in nature also bore such comfortable resemblance to that elder and altogether well-beloved dick who was the delight of her life yes dear old chap i'll come she said only it must really be for a little weeny while because you must go to sleep by the way who's going to valet you these holidays clara or falstitch oh neither the boy answered i think i'm rather old for women now don't you know honoria at which statement she laughed his cheek being again tucked tight into the turn of her neck i shall have andrews in future i asked cousin richard about it he's a very civil-mannered fellow and he knows about yachts and things and he says he likes being up before five o'clock oh does he excellently voracious young man honoria remarked but thereupon exuberance of joy demanding active expression the boy broke away with a hoop and set off running the puppies lolloped away at his heels and young lady carmody whom such giddy fancies still took at times notwithstanding nearly three years of marriage flew after the trio the train of her dress floating out behind her to most admired extravagance of length as she skimmed along the path fair lady boy and dogs disappeared with sounds of merriment into the near garden hall reappeared upon the terrace bearing down but at sobering pace upon the occupants of the chairs set at the end of it one man rose to his feet a tall narrow black figure the other remained seated the light shining forth from the great bay window of the hall touched the little group conferring a certain grandeur upon the graceful white-clad honoria her satin dress shimmered as she moved there was as of old a triumph of high purity of freedom of soul in her aspect her voice came with a fine gladness yet soft richness of tone across that intervening triangular space of sloping turf upon which terrace and troco ground alike looked down the nightingale who had fallen silent during the skirmish took up his passionate singing again and was answered delicately a song not of the flesh but of the spirit by the bird from across the valley catherine carmody stood solitary watching listening her hands folded rather high on her bosom the caressing suavity of the summer night enfolded her and remembrance came to her of another night 
nearly four and thirty years ago, when, standing in this same spot, she, young, untried, ambitious of unlimited delight, had felt the first mysterious pangs of motherhood, and told her husband of that new unseen life which was at once his and her own, and of yet another night, when after long experience of sorrow, solitude and revolt, her husband had come to her once again, but come even as the bird's song came from across the valley, etherealized, spiritualized, the same, yet endowed with qualities of unearthly beauty, and how that strange and exquisite communion with the dead had fortified her to endure an anguish even greater than any she had yet known. She had prayed that night that she might behold the face of her well-beloved, and her prayer had been granted. She had prayed that without reservation she might be absorbed by and conform to the divine will, and that prayer had, as she humbly trusted, been in great measure granted also. But then, the divine will had proved so very merciful, the divine intention so wholly beneficent, there was small credit in being conformed to either. Catherine bowed her head in thanksgiving. The goodness of the Almighty towards her had been abundant beyond asking or fondest hope. She was aroused from her gracious meditation by the sound of footsteps, measured, a little weary perhaps, approaching her. She looked up to see Julius March, and a point of gentle anxiety pricked Catherine, for it occurred to her that Julius had failed somewhat in health and energy of late. She reproached herself, lest in the interest of watching those vigorous young lives so dear to her, participating in their schemes, basking in the sunshine of their love, she had neglected Julius, and failed to care for his comfort as she might. To those that have shall be given even of sympathy, even of strength. In that there is an ironical as well as an equitable truth, and she was to blame, perhaps, in the ironical application of it. It followed, therefore, that she greeted him now with a quickening both of solicitude and of affection. "'Come and pace, dear Julius, come and pace,' she said, as in times past. Yet not wholly as in the past, for then often I must have distressed and troubled you, since my pacings were too often the outcome of restlessness and of unruly passion. Well, now... Catherine broke off, gazing at the little company gathered upon the terrace. Oh, surely they are very happy, she said, almost involuntarily. And he, smiling at his dear lady's incapacity of escape from her fixed idea, replied, Yes, very surely. Catherine tied the white lace coif she wore a little tighter beneath her chin. In their happiness I renew that of my own youth, she said gently, as it is granted to few women, I imagine, to renew it. But I renew it with a reverence for them, since my own happiness was plain sailing enough, obvious, incontestable, while theirs is nobler and rises to a higher plane. For its roots, after all, are planted in very mournful fact, to which it has risen superior, and over which it has triumphed. But he answered, jealous of his dear lady's self-depreciation, I can hardly admit that. To begin in unclouded promise of happiness, to decline to searching an unusual experience of sorrow, and then by self-discipline and obedience to attain your present altitude of tranquillity and assurance of faith, is surely a greater trial, a greater triumph, than to begin with difficulties, with much, I admit, to overcome and resist, but to succeed as they are succeeding, and be granted the high land of happiness which they even now possess. They are young, fortune smiles on them. Above all, they have one another. Oh, yes, she said, they have one another, and long may that last. It is a very perfect marriage of true minds as well as true hearts. I had, and they have, all that love can give. Lady Carmody turned at the end of the walk. 
but it troubles me as a sort of emptiness and waste dear julius that you have never had that it pains me that you who possess so noble a power of disinterested and untiring friendship should never have enjoyed that other and nearer relation which transcends friendship even as to-morrow's dawn will transcend in loveliness the chastened restfulness of this evening's dusk catherine moved onward with a certain sweet dignity of manner tell me is she still alive julius this lady whom you so loved yes thank god he said and you have never tried to elude that vow which as you once told me you made long ago before you knew her never he replied without it i could not have served her as i have been able to serve her i am wholly thankful for it it made much possible which must have otherwise been impossible and have you never told her that you loved her even yet no he replied because had i told her i must have ceased to serve her i must have left her catherine and i did not think god required that of me lady carmody walked on in silence her head a little bent at the end of the path she stood a moment listening to the answering songs of the two nightingales ah she said softly how greatly i have underrated the beauty of the dusk to submit to dwell in the borderland to stand on the dim bridge thus between day and night demands perhaps the very finest courage conceivable you have shown me julius how exquisite and holy a thing it is and as to her whom you have so faithfully loved i think could she know she would thank you very deeply for never telling her the truth she would entreat you to keep your secret to the end but to remain near her to let her seek counsel of you when in perplexity or distress to talk with her both of those you and she love and have loved and of the promise of fair things beyond and above our present seeing pacing with her at times even as you and i dear friend pace together here to-night amid the restrained and solemn beauty of the dusk would she not do this it is enough that you have done it for her catherine he answered with your ruling i am wholly unendingly content perhaps dicky and honoria's dear works of mercy and the noonday tide of energy which flows through the house have caused us to see less of each other than of old lady carmody continued with a charming lightness that is a mistake needing correction the young to the young dear julius you and i who go at a quieter pace will enjoy our peaceful friendship to the full i shall not tire of your company i promise you if you do not of mine long may you be spared to me god keep you most loyal friend good night then lady carmody deeply touched yet unmoved from her altitude of thankfulness and calm musing of many matters and the working out of them to a beneficent and noble end slowly went the length of the terrace to where at the foot of the steps of the garden hall richard still sat as she came near he held out his hand to her dear sweet mother he said how i like to see you walk in that stately fashion the whole of you body mind and spirit somehow evident gathered up within the delicious compass of yourself as far back as i can remember anything i remember that when i watched you it always made me feel safe it seemed more like music heard somehow than something seen oh dicky dicky she exclaimed flushing a little don't make me vain in my old age but it's true he said and why shouldn't one tell the pretty truths as well as the plain ones isn't it a positively divine night look at the moon just clearing the top of the firs there oh it is good to be alive mother may i say it i am very grateful to you for having brought me into the world oh but my 
poor darling catherine cried oh no no he said put that out of your dear head once and for all i am grateful being as i am grateful for everything it being as it is i don't believe i would have anything not anything save those four years when i left you altered even if i could i found my work and it enlarges its borders in all manner of directions and it prospers and i have money to put it through and i have that boy he's a dear little chap and it's wonderfully good of uncle roger and mary to give him to me but he's getting a trifle too fond of horses i can't break poor old chiffney's heart but when his days are numbered those of the stables as far as training racers go are numbered likewise i think i'll keep on the stud farm but i grow doubtful about the rest i wish it wasn't so but so it is sport is changing hands passing from those of romance into those of commerce well the stables serve their turn they help to bring me through but now perhaps they're a little out of the picture richard drew her hand nearer and kissed it leaning back in his chair and looking up at her and i have you he said you most perfect of mothers and ah here comes honoria End of chapter 11 of book 6 End of the History of Sir Richard Carmody by Lucas Mallet